And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Katayun Zanvakili, who was with angels during her near-death experience, which today we're going to learn about and more. Katayun, thank you for joining me and welcome. Hello, Jeff. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor and a delight for me to get a chance to speak about this experience publicly. Katayun, let's start on the day of your accident and go from there. Perfect. Um, Actually, I had a premonition about the accident the day before it happened. Mm. Um, So that would be in August uh, 2002. I was in Truckee for a writer's conference. And I was going for a hike with a dear friend that I'd met at the conference. And I just felt this incredible sense of anguish and dread like I had never felt before. Like some, like a dark, dark cloud, like something coming for me. And I just couldn't, I couldn't explain it. And at the time I had just recently enrolled in a meditation slash clairvoyant school in Marin. Um, so I called them and I said, you know, I knew that there was a women's healing line that night. And I asked if I could, a spirit, just be placed in line because of this energy I, I couldn't comprehend and was very nervous about. And they said, you know, gosh, we think it's this, the lady who answered, this wonderful woman, and said, you know, it could be the competition energy from other writers because there were a lot of editors and agents at this conference. And I said, no, you know, it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> feels like something way bigger and just different. And so in any event, she put me in the, in the healing line for that night. And um, the next day I went to a class and was actually in a, a class with a well-known journalist whose friend would happen to be an agent and was interested in uh, potentially optioning my manuscript that I had taken to the writer's conference. So that was great news. And we were going to have a class at about 5.30 p.m. Um, So I got on the phone with my then fiance and um, he was a lawyer in San Francisco. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. This this thing might happen with this book and all good news. And then I gave a friend a ride to the condos because all the writers lived in condos. And I had a Volvo station wagon at the time that I had just paid off. And I was heading on Highway 87, which runs parallel to the Truckee River. And I saw, and I always blessed my car just instinctively. And I had named him Don Antonio. And I went towards... um, the light and was was really grateful because I saw a car running the red light and I thought, oh gosh, I'm so, you know, these trucky drivers are so kind of out of control with their trucks. I'm so grateful that the gentleman behind me in the truck is keeping a really generous distance and is mindful and isn't, you know. So I was really happy. And we get to the stop sign, we make a left, and I had seen the word adventure with a capital A in my mind's eye. As I, after I blessed my car that day, and I kind of thought, just kind of nothing of it, like, why am I seeing this work? Make a left, and I'm first in my line of cars going about 50, and it's, it's that highway is just separated by a double yellow line, one lane going, one lane coming, and the mountains are here, and this gentleman is, you know, the top of his line of cars, and we are almost past each other when, um, he just comes into my car. He just cr- crossed the double yellow and I tried to go to the right, pulled really hard to the right, but the Volvo was, you know, it's, it's like a tank, but it's, it's a tank. So I couldn't escape him. And we ended up um, locked at the left light and uh, my car started spinning and there was a lot of heat and smell of rubber from the floorboards and the car is just spinning. And I, uh, I guess the airbag, you know, went off and there was a voice. Sorry, I get emotional. 
So as it started spinning, um, when he first when he first came over, I had so much terror and rage at because I didn't hear a tire blow. It made no sense. But the thing that happened that was strange was his head went on the wheel and it was five o'clock in the afternoon, 5.05. And I just couldn't understand why this man was like over here. And so I was in that state, but there was this thought from here that was, you're not going to kill me. Once I realized the, the dramatic severity of the situation and that I was going to die. I, I just knew it. And I was like, you're not going to kill me. We're spinning. Everything's spinning. I, I can't tell you what I saw. I just know that I was still holding on to the wheel at the end. And there was a voice, Jeff, that was my voice. And that voice was, oh, this is what they mean when they say it's a bad accident. Because I had gotten 100 on my driver's test. I was pretty much a goody two-shoes kind of a driver, very courteous, tried to be. And then, and then there was an angel on my right that was a male angel and a female angel on my left, who, as far as I remember, stayed silent. And he said in a very a neutral, beautiful voice that became the voice of the accident, he said, this is a bad enough accident that if you want to go, you can go. The car is still spinning. And I remember that I shot out of my body because um, I felt like I, the pain was coming on from my injuries. And um, I saw a yes and a no in the sky, like chandeliers, like part of chandeliers. And in that split second of having to make this choice, I realized that um, I had been good my whole life, but I hadn't lived my life. I just did what my family wanted. I was very obedient and very dutiful, and I didn't do me. I did the life that they wanted for me. And I decided to stay. I was also terrified of dying, but I decided to stay, and I was amazed at the choice I was given. I mean, that was just all right there. And then when the car, and, and I remember them as being, I didn't see them because, I mean, I didn't turn to see them, but I was aware of them. And to me, the two beings were like translucent or something. They were softer colors um, like that. But I didn't, I have a sense of their energy very deeply because it, they stayed with me, but not their physical characteristics necessarily and then um when the car stopped finally stopped i remember i saw people running across the freeway there the highway and they were uh yelling call 911 and you know 2002 i had just gotten my first little motorola flip cell phone it was my first phone and i thought oh gee this is like the state of shock Oh, um, I have a cell phone. I should call 911, you know, like, and then wondering what was happening and, and feeling like my car might explode. And the reason for that was that there is actually gunpowder, I found out later, in the airbags. And when you smell that and you've seen as many Hollywood movies as I have, I just thought this car is going to explode. It's going to explode. It did not, but I was terrified and I wanted to get out. And I also knew that I was sort of pinned um, inside the driver's seat. I had my seatbelt on and there was no one in my car uh, other than me. And when I looked at the door, my door was like, my door was dead. I can't explain it. I still can't remember exactly. I kept thinking in a sort of a magical thinking that if I could remember my door, I would be over the accident like months later i've never been able to recall but i just remember it was so stripped because the driver that hit me from the insurance photos he took the second door off my station wagon he cut through my car like like butter essentially and he was in a station himself he was in a ford mercure and he went through my car and then 
he hit the car, the Ford Bronco truck behind me, the gentleman that I thought was keeping such a great distance and was so courteous as a driver. And that car, that truck hit my car as well. So it was like Keystone Cops. And um, I just wanted to get out of my car. I was convinced it was going to explode or catch on fire. And then as I am sitting there, just breathing, both hands on the wheel, I hear a tap and I turn and it's um, a gentleman named Tim and I think his colleague and I can't remember that gentleman's name. And they they motioned to me to open your door, open your door. So here's this defunct Volvo and I hit the doors unlock and it allowed me to unlock the doors. And I gently lifted my leg over the gear shift and they were like, come, come, come to us, come to us. And I remember that I could um, uh, taste blood coming from my nose from, from the impact of the airbag. And the first question I asked them was, um, how does my face look? And they were like, you look fine, just come on out. Because they also were afraid the car might explode, I think. And so we we stood there. Um, they shut the freeway, the CHB, for three hours that night. And it turns out that my car had stopped at a tiny bit of guardrail. So the guardrail there is intermittent. And it just happened that with all the spinning, it had backed up against the guardrail. And they called the, um, you know, the paramedics and the ambulance came. And then they asked me if I wanted to wait and if they could put my jacket down for me because they saw that I was standing with one leg up sort of uh, on, on toes on my left foot because I, I had broken bones. But I just didn't want to know about the pain. I was ice cold. I just wanted, I just kept saying how lucky I was, how blessed I was, and that I did hot yoga five times a week, which was true at that time. And um, then as we're standing there and they're saying, you know, we can put your jacket down again, shock. I said, no, no, you know, why incur further dry cleaning costs? I'm fine. I'll just, I'll just stand here. Paramedics come, we go to the hospital and everyone's screaming hip surgery, hip surgery. And I have, you know, a gash here at my elbow and a gash at my knee from the impact with the door. And um, we, we went to the hospital. Uh, the other driver was in the ambulance with me because he was asleep for the impact. He was complaining, I remember, of pain in his thumbs. And then we went in being uh, told hip surgery and they put me on the x-ray slab at the Truckee Hospital three times because I was complaining of severe pain at my, uh, what turned out to be the sacrum, but they didn't catch that. They just caught a pelvic break. So they said, your pelvis is broken, but it's non-displaced and we're not going to do any surgery. Um, we're just going to release you. And a nurse came and she saw my left thigh and she said, "You, sh they should not be releasing you. You were hit by two cars and you're uh, really hurt. And in fact, I had a bruise on my left thigh for a year and a half. It took for that bruise to heal. Just it was it became like jet black basically for months from the impact. And. And that was that was it. I was released to the care of a friend who the friend I'd hiked with the day before, who when she came and saw the car and people who heard the accident and were living um, in apartments on the other side of the river, they all thought that there was a fatality in that accident. They couldn't believe anybody could have survived that. So um, when I was on the x-ray slab, again, it, it just incredibly sobering because I felt that it was, I had not been a cold person in my life and my life felt cold to me. And I kind of couldn't understand why. I didn't understand what, what I had done wrong and why I felt like that. And I thought partly it was just the shock. I did cry that night for about six hours straight. It's just shock releasing. And I 
was brought back to the Bay Area. And I had a long journey ahead in terms of uh, healing from the PTSD from that incident. And also I had complex PTSD, which I didn't really know about until the accident. And then really it was a question of vibrating really softly, like very, very sensitively. And not just because I was healing bones, but because I had, it's like, it's like the portals opened, the dimensions had opened for a split second for me. And it, I got so blown open and felt so vulnerable and really saw things that I I didn't know about, like voices. And then it took me a few years to put together that this male angel's voice was a voice that I heard in 1996 when I was hospitalized for um, hepatitis A. I traveled to the Middle East at that time and come back and I had some sort of infectious thing. They, they knew it was hep A, but they weren't sure what else. So they put me in the isolation ward. And that first night in the isolation ward, um, when everyone left, I, I heard, you know, him say, you must help a lot of people, like sort of in a, like a, like a matter of fact, not a command, just you must help a lot of people. And I remember I opened my eyes. They had given me Demerol for pain. And I thought, who was, who was that? And he said it again. I didn't see uh, any uh, entity or being. I just heard the voice twice. And then I went back to sleep. And when my friends visited that week, it was Thanksgiving week. Um, sorry, in 95, I don't know if I said 96, but it was in 95. Um, was, sorry, I think it was November of 94. Sorry, November of 94. Um, I said uh, to them, gosh, you know, I think I'm supposed to like help a lot of people just float the idea. And they said, oh, you've helped us so much. Just like go back to sleep. And, and so I forgot about it until 2002. So that's really, that was it. And afterwards I just became, I explored more, took more courses, studied more, became more curious about um, other people who had experienced near death and, or even had been dead for a while. And that's really the, it's really the, the gist of what happened in that accident. Katayun, thank you for sharing your experience with us. The day before this happened, you went in line for some type of healing. Do you yes. think that helped it in any way with this NDE? I do. I've thought about that as well, uh, Jeff, and I think it did for sure. But I think in that in the final moment, the choice was really up to my spirit. Like, do you want to stay or go? I think if I had really wanted to leave, I could have left. Um, I did not know about the severity of the accident until I saw the insurance photos. I think it was about a year later when I got them. And I remember my grandmother who was living at the time and I, we just burst into tears because the car on the driver's side looked like the Terminator had happened to it. It was just completely demolished. And seeing the photo, you would think there's no way this person could have gotten out fairly intact. So I have to, I just have to believe in my own experience of what it was, you know? And I remember um, in the ER room, the uh, CHP officer coming and speaking with me. He was a very nice man. And he um, said, do, do you know that two cars hit you? And I said, no, I just saw one car. And he explained how the other truck as well, you know, had had to hit me because of the impact from the first car. And so, and then he, he said, you know, thank God you were in a Volvo. And the, the mind is amazing at getting rid of extraneous things just to help you survive. So when we received the insurance photos, I remember there's a beam, I guess the Volvo is famous for, and that beam was 
at a diagonal all the way through the car cabin. And of course the windshield was, was cracked. Um, all this kind of thing. I don't, I didn't remember that. And here was a beam all the way in the, I didn't remember and I didn't remember the door, but I just knew I couldn't get out that way. Um, so yeah, it's amazing our ability to survive. And yes, I do think the healing definitely helped. During the accident, but just before the angels communicated with you, did you ever surrender to the accident? Like say, okay, I guess this is the end or think something similar. No, I mean, I, I just, it was such a bright, beautiful day. I just didn't want to die. And I didn't think it was time. I really didn't. I felt like this, this is, I, I, it was just too soon. It wasn't my time, I felt. And I couldn't do that. Um, yes, I, I have one friend. She told me that, um, because as I mentioned to you, I was sort of uh, really drawn to near-death experiencers um, like myself or I still am, but in the beginning it was very intense. And she told me that a car was coming at her pretty much like to T-bone her car. And she thought, this is it. And she actually said, thank you. And I thought, oh my gosh, yeah, I did not have that kind of grace in that moment. That was not given to me. So no, that wasn't my experience. I know you're going to have to guess, obviously, but you were given a choice whether to stay or go. Why do you think some people choose to go? Hmm. I've thought about that a lot. I feel um, I feel that they just are done here. I felt, you know, and I've heard so many talk about life reviews, and I suppose I had mine in the sense of realizing that I, I didn't remember anything like negative other than I just did what I was told because of the cultural expectations and my particular family's rules and things. And I missed like my true deep life. I just kept trying to be selfless and appease the system I was in. And um, that's why I stayed. I think other people, they just might feel done I don't know. I don't know if everyone gets a choice. I don't know. I know some people feel very called drawn there or drawn back here. I was surprised I was given a choice. Was there anything during your NDE that drew you to stay? I was a really fearful person at that time. I had a lot of fear. Um, just a lot of childhood trauma. And I, like I said, I couldn't believe that angels would be talking to me or that there would be a voice or any of that. Um, I think I stayed to work through that and to um, be a sort of, a, without putting too fine a point on it, and forgive me if this doesn't sound humble, but um, be a sort of a line breaker for certain energies that I think a lot of us in the world are cleaning up right now and putting an end to. And that was definitely, I think, a commitment on my part to stay to um, go through the pain of that and hopefully be able to make some good, bring in new energies replenishing energies and nourishing energies that aren't the old patterns, but new patterns. I hope, I hope that's why I stayed. I feel it is. I hope that's, you know, not just from fear, but it was like, you know, there's work to be done, kind of <laughs> really deep work. You mentioned while you were outside of your body that you saw yes or no. Did you see anything else? I just remember shooting way up in the sky. You know, it was a bright, sunny day. And I just remember just leaving my body. I don't remember looking down at my body or anything like that. Just like as a spirit, like 
I'm out of here because I knew that the pain, the impact was uh, severe. Um, and I think I saw the yes and the no as chandeliers. Just It's just part of my whimsy and just part of my artistic brain. It just works like that. So I think that's why I saw it that way. Um, yeah. Would you say that you were out of your body just before the moment of pain, so you never really experienced it? Yes, I, I didn't feel the pain um, until, well, maybe a little bit on the gurney in the ambulance. And then in the hospital, I was complaining of pain, in my like stabbing pain in the in my uh, what turned out to be my sacrum, but they because they didn't catch it on the x-ray, um bed I just you know I just assumed it was just muscle issues or something but in fact I had cracked the sacrum all the way through which would they found out in an MRI once I got back to San Francisco and went to the machine through the machine here have you had any more communication with the male angel since the accident I have I do um that's really been the biggest change I feel like it enabled me to, in a way, bridge two worlds, that what I call the realms, and then our world here with the banks and the buildings and people and um, our responsibilities and our lives. It just made me um, just have awarenesses that the air around me is not empty, if that makes sense. In what way are you still communicating with this angel? I experienced both of them. I have come to know their names. Um, and when I paint, I started painting after my accident. I painted when I was little and through school on and off and even a little bit in, in uh, college and grad school. But I hadn't, you know, devoted myself to it. And then I started a real practice with with painting that I just really went to with heart and soul. And I could just kind of feel them almost like dragging me to the studio, like, oh, let's go, let's go paint. And a lot of times um, I would do paintings that in the beginning didn't make a lot of sense to me because I think I was, I feel I was trying to capture the realms and the angels didn't necessarily look like what people think of as angels sometimes, you know, like it was just in a very intense energy. And I've actually, you know, in watching various things over the years, consciousness expanding films and documentaries and things, I've wondered because it's been asked of me, what well, do you think they were ETs? Do you think they were, I mean, you know, all kinds of, um, I'm not sure. I, I, I can't say for sure to me, they felt um, very strong energy, but also in letting me make the choice, very spacious and letting me just decide. They weren't going to say one way or another how this should go. I, I would have to choose. So that was yeah, really incredible, that moment. And it's, I, re I returned to that moment with them almost daily sometimes, I would say, several times a day, not out of trauma, but because um, it was the most definitive moment of my life so far. You said you returned to that moment. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that you just kind of meditate and remember the accident or kind of relive the accident and being with the angels? Not the accident. Um, I drive. I you know, I live a full life, but just him on the right, her on the left, and me in the middle. Um, I don't know, maybe they were parenting me in a way that was really sublime. I don't know. There was definitely a transmission. And what I found difficult, and the reason that I really didn't speak about it publicly until now, 21 years later almost, is um, sometimes people didn't hear that kind of thing very well. You know, if, um, they thought it was 
maybe not humble or they thought that um, these things just don't exist. It's just in your mind. It's something the brain does when you're spinning in a car like that. And it's natural to think that. But there was a difference between my own thought about this being a bad accident and then his voice. Um, I don't hear his voice often, but I feel their presence a lot, a lot. Some people will say that we have spirit guides or angels with us at all times. Do you think they're with you at all times? I do. I think sometimes I forget to call on them and sometimes I forget to listen, but I do. And I feel that to me, everybody does. To me, that's just kind of how it is. That's how I see things. I think people all have their protective guides and their spirit guides, angels, however they want to call it. Um, yes, that's just my, but I don't want to impose on anyone else. You know, if they don't believe then that's, that's valid for them. I think part of the reason that I saw them was maybe I really believed in them before I had been in other uh, sort of physical scrapes before the car wreck that were, um, also very intense, but I'd never had an experience like that with beings. So yeah, I felt, I felt really blessed by it and by them. After your NDE, did you get any new abilities that could be considered psychic that you didn't have prior? Well, it's interesting. I had um, been going to the meditation or clairvoyance school in Marin um, for a few months before the accident. And I, I went back once I got off crutches and things, and I completed the advanced clairvoyant program there. And I also um, loved doing the hands-on healing program. It felt very natural to me. I am someone that was always very clairsentient. So I could kind of walk in a room and read it from second chakra, basically, what was happening, the emotions and the energies in the room. And in clairvoyance, you know, you're encouraged to come up and use your third eye and in the accident it was also amazing to me that the command that came from my third eye was you're not going to kill me um I don't know where that came from but it was very intense and and like a deep source of power within me so I spent um all these all this time you know healing and learning and trying to expand and always being like a student um, ever since. So, yes. You mentioned earlier that you had fear in your life prior to this NDE. Do you feel like you've conquered that fear since? I do. I do, Jeff. I do. It's amazing. Um, I, I feel I have. And I had an experience about maybe a month and a half ago now, where I sort of traveled out and I realized that I'm not afraid to die. And I feel it's just an amazing feeling, but I just, I know that I'm not afraid to die. So I feel like I, whatever that childhood thing was, I cleared. And um, yes. Would you say that the fear of death is the root of all of your fears? No, actually, I think for me, it was the fear of not having lived as me, like having been controlled so much that I couldn't be free to live my life and express myself authentically as who I am, not just what, you know, like is in a special frame that everyone in the family could approve of, but just, just me. And now I sort of have this little mantra that I say, um, a feral cat adopted me about two years ago and she's really blessed my life and she loves to do mirror work. She'll sit in front of this mirror in our dressing room and insists on it. So I started sitting on a cushion with her and just, you know, we just do mirror work together. I pet her and I, I read a book or something, but, um, I like to now just say, you know, I'm just myself, just myself. That has to be good enough. 
for now. <laughs> Can you share with us how you changed your life and kind of became more sovereign and more of your real self after your NDE? Yes. It was not a quick, I wish I could say it was overnight or, oh, I saw the light because then they spoke to me and I got it. And in a week I was, you know, doing things differently. No, I, I was, um, I had, I think I had trouble seeing myself at that time, correct, accurately, correctly, and seeing my situations correctly. So it took time. It took a long time. And then there were a lot of things I did not want to see things I was in denial about. Mm, I would say that was the brunt of it. Like once I got through that, then the resistance melted, um, my resistance. And I could see, oh, gee, I could just do that differently. Oh, I could choose to do this other thing. But I had conditioning and I had a lot of um, sort of edicts in my space, a lot of commands. And I really, really wanted to be good and have love and approval. So in the past, so I would do all kinds of pretzeling to get that. And um, then after the accident, you know, there's really nothing quite like having 200 mile an hour collisions and then sitting in your bed for a few weeks, unable to do a lot of running, which is what I used to do, not physical running, but just I'm here, I'm there, I'm doing this, I'm so busy, it's busy, 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 and yet kind of missing the main river, the main stream of my life. And then once I dropped into that, dropped into my body, which I was trying to avoid at all costs, because that was all where all the pain points were, not just physical, but emotional and intergenerational and all this. It just became such a rich and deep experience of living into the life that was meant for me, that I was designed for, not as a part of my family or a part of a couple or a part of this or that, but just individualistically, just like what is going on. And I set up my life in a way that I could explore that. So with art and creativity, with readings, after this cat came, I uh, got trained in animal communication because I wanted to know her backstory. She's a, a mature cat. And she would talk a lot being a tuxedo. And I wanted to know, well, where did you come from and what happened? And I, I couldn't see beyond what I knew through clairvoyance and clairsentience and things. And I took courses and it's amazing how the world will just open up to you if you have the particular little techniques that they teach and it's just wonderful. So that's what I mean by kind of like living more and more into and, and using not just me, but all of us, our true abilities. It's not just me that can see these things or sense these things. I think we all have it. But when we're conditioned to just do our nine to five, or we accept a lot of the structure of how the planet's set up, then it's exciting to go beyond that. What inspires you about your NDE? Um, I would say that um, the grace of the angels. And also their, um, their no nonsense I did not experience them as cuddly or, you know, like sweet. There was a sweetness, but they were not, um, pardon my tears. They just held this universal cosmic love energy that was not teddy bear, but it was just the truth. And, and to me, that's grace. So that's what I, I think that's why my brain and my body still want want to connect with them because they were my um, and are my teachers, like my guides. How has your family and your friends adapted to the new you? Uh, my friends are fantastic. They're very, very um, involved with their own spiritual paths let's say, for lack of a better word, I say spiritual, I don't know what other word to use, but they're they're just wonderful, 
really generous, open-hearted um, people who uh, were always, you know, calling each other or texting each other. And once we find something, whether it's a show or a podcast like this or a book or an idea or something we heard or something we experienced or, you know, I saw a little fox came in my backyard um, yesterday on the hillside, uh, separating my lot from my neighbors up here. And he was walking through and I saw my cat see him and then she didn't want to go out and running to the book about Native American lore on foxes and what that means, which I've already earmarked, but sometimes I tend to forget. Um, so things like this, like the whimsy of every day and little moments and being present to not miss those moments. That, um, that's that been incredible. Um, my family, I wish they were a little bit more interested in the NDE, um, but they, they really aren't. So I don't really discuss, I don't push it on anybody. What about your spiritual or religious beliefs? What were they like before and how did they change after? So I'm someone who, um, I was born in Tehran, in Iran, and we left when I was a child, went back for a few years and left permanently when I was in the fourth grade. And I uh, grew up as a, like a secular Muslim, but at one point as a family, we went on Hajj in 1996. Um, I wish that that had, you know, I wish I could say, oh, that really, you know, it was a wonderful experience. I'll never forget. But I have also gone to many churches and been with friends at different kinds of, um, you know, weddings from different traditions, very religious weddings. And I think it's all beautiful. But after the near death, I just, I don't know. And it's funny, Jeff, I, I so gravitate towards the angelic realm. And even I don't really talk much about source or God. Um, but just, I don't know, I feel like the angels are so much more immediate for me somehow. So I don't, um, I'm very ritualistic as a painter, as a writer, things like that. I'm very sort of, I have rituals around that, but I don't practice officially. I, I And I'm someone who needs to meditate a couple of times a day um, to sort of regroup and recenter myself. Um, I tend to have like a wide open crown chakra and lots of stuff floating around. So I need to kind of drop in, but a walk in nature for me is, can be very sacred. I think you mentioned earlier that you have painted the angels and the realms. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything with you to show us? Or if not, can we see it on a website or something? Oh, I would love it if you would like to go to my website. Um, I would, I would love that. I would love that. It's my full name, um, com. I have a, um, that's my painting site and I, there's a link there to my writing site as well. Um, thank you for asking. That's very kind. Thank you. You're welcome. And what do you write about? I write poetry. I have a book of poetry through University of Georgia Press. Um, that was, I, I think it's now out of print. It came out in 1999, so it's it's old. And I have a new book of poetry that um, a friend and I are thinking we've been having conversations about doing a press together. So I've been culling manuscripts that way. And I had a book, um, that I'm transforming into something else. Um, and it's basically about living from soul and reclaiming um, lost parts of ourselves or parts that we might think we can't heal or parts that we've abandoned. Um, that's what I'm working on. What kind of advice would you give to people who are not living their authentic self? You know, I think that's okay too. <laughs> I think we all we all struggle with that. Um, I don't think I have any um, 
Anything to to say, well, gee, come on over to this side of the line. You know, I, I slip up all the time. I I regress, I backtrack, I take five steps back, two steps forward. Um, I would just say to just drop into our own love for ourselves, however that manifests, as much of it as, as you have or don't have on any given day. It's just it's just about love I think at the end I think it's just love and tears you know um love for for self also not just giving it out but also just really valuing ourselves currently narcissism is such a big topic in the media but do you yeah. think really there's a lot of people out there that don't have much love for themselves I think there's so much conditioning and so much unresolved trauma. That's what I see when I when I look out. I just see that, you know, it's 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 like a lot of woundedness that manifests in different ways, and it actually really makes me sad. And to see that people are taking steps to working each person on themselves as that's just like, what bigger gift can you ask for, you know? But I, I really feel that's the main thing is to you know, just, just be together in love as much as possible. And if it's not possible, I avoid. <laughs> I don't stick around anymore like I used to, hoping that things will get better. And um, all of this, I just realize that there are better experiences to be had and I enjoy my own company. Um, so sure. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Absolutely. I would be honored. What's the and best, so what's the best way to reach you? My email, which is on my website and I can give it to you here. It's a cat K A T at my first full name, Katayun, K-A-T-A-Y-O-O-N, art, A-R-T, dot com. And that's my Gmail address. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes, it's just, um, just enjoy your moments. Enjoy the grace of our lives. You know, your life, my life, all of our lives. It's really about the moments and the preciousness of it. and. It just goes so much faster than we think to so just enjoy our lives and have joy and follow soul. It doesn't always look pretty or, you know, uh, doesn't make sense necessarily in a worldly way. But I feel this is the time where we can just all kind of expand out and let go of these old patterns and stop limiting ourselves. And, and go forth and live more from our souls and have different experiences in our life and create different things with other people, collaborations and all kinds of good things. So and that's my prayer is, is for more joy for everyone. Kata Yoon, thank you for that message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you, Jeff, so much. It's been just my honor and a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.